uh, uh, told you I was coming and uh, that I also answer to the name Mike Garrick. Um, like my father, I'm a naval aviator. I've been uh, in the U.S. Navy for about 22 years now. Um, unlike my father who uh, flew the P-3 Orion in the heart of the Cold War, uh, I have spent most of my career flying the EA-6B Prowler, pictured before you here, uh, which is an uh, electronic attack uh, platform, so uh, radar and communications jamming. Uh, I was fortunate enough to transition for my command tour to the EA-18G Growler, which is the follow-on platform. Um, so. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here uh, to talk to you today. Uh, apologies uh, and, uh, and thanks for your patience because of the missteps that we had earlier. Um, <coughs> I'm happy to talk about the Prowler and the Growler um, and any other questions you have during question and answer, um, but, the, uh, but the topic for today is carrier aviation, so let's get to it. 18 January 1911, San Francisco Bay. Um, a uh, civilian pilot named Eugene Eli uh, had gotten to know a Navy captain named Washington Chambers who was on commission with the uh, U.S. Navy to investigate the potential that, na uh, that air uh, aircraft might have in naval warfare. So on this day in January 1911, Eugene Eli became the first person in history to land an aircraft on board a ship. In this case, it was the USS Pennsylvania. It's important to note that the ship was at anchor in San Francisco Bay, okay, so it wasn't moving. Um, it's also important to note um, that although Eli had managed to launch an airplane two months prior in November of 1910, uh, I think that was the USS Birmingham. Please come on in. Although he had managed to launch an airplane in November of 1910, uh, U.S. Naval Carrier Aviation marks its birth from this event. Um, which just goes to show the old adage that we have in uh, tactical aviation, or what we call TAC Air, that you're only as good as your last pass. You're only as good as your last attempt to land on board the carrier. As some of you may know, uh, about a year uh, and change later, in May of 1912, this man, Commodore Charles Sampson, uh, was the first person, became the first person to launch an airplane from a moving ship. In this case, it was HMS Hibernia. It was the Royal Fleet Review just off of Weymouth. World War I saw the uh, advent of the world's first purpose-built aircraft carrier in HMS Ark Royal. Now, Ark Royal, for the World War I uh, iteration of the, uh, of the ship that bore that name, um, was not a conventional carrier in the sense uh, that we understand today. It was a seaplane carrier. Um, so um, she did see some operational uh, action, um, notably against uh, Goben, which was uh, the German ship that uh, um, essentially single-handedly brought the Ottoman Empire into the war. Um, but she, because her uh, role wasn't fully matured or understood uh, by the powers that be, um, she was often relegated to either experimentation or simply ferrying aircraft to and from the fight. On 2 August 1917, six and a half years after Eugene Eli had made his historic flight uh, onto USS Pennsylvania, um, a man uh, named Squadron Commander uh, uh, Edwin Harris Dunning uh, became the first person to land uh, an aircraft on board a moving vessel. So he, pilot he piloted his Sopwith Pup onto HMS Furious in the Scapa Flow. Um, unfortunately, he was lost tragically five days later, attempting another uh, landing on board Furious. Um, and it just goes to show, even at that early, early stage, how uh, unforgiving the business of carrier aviation can be. As you all know, World War II uh, saw the aircraft carrier um, and air power, naval strike uh, air power, come into its own. The technology had matured, the doctrine had matured to that point that both American and, uh, and British carriers were able to inflict some crippling blows against Axis targets, both ashore and at sea. It is telling that the fact that um, all of the U.S. Pacific Fleet carriers were absent from Pearl Harbor when the Japanese attacked on 7 December 1941, um, and then went on to help turn the tide of the war in the Pacific. Um, that fact still influences U.S. naval uh, doctrine to this day. Following World War II, three innovations uh, it allowed the aircraft carrier to evolve from the day of propeller-driven aircraft to the day, uh, the age of the jet. So the first is the angled deck. So instead of just having a deck that is oriented with the longitudinal axis of the ship, um, we offset that landing portion of the deck 10, approximately 10 degrees. 
Um, and what that allows is for the simultaneous, the safe launch and uh, recovery of aircraft simultaneously. Um, more importantly, it allows aircraft who are, that are landing to land deconflicted from other stuff, other aircraft and people that are on the deck. The next, uh, the next innovation uh, pictured here uh, are the steam-powered catapults um, and the associated uh, hydraulic, hydraulically braked steam-driven uh, arresting gear um, that are powerful enough to accommodate jet aircraft um, that weigh in on launch at about 60,000 pounds uh, and on landing at approximately 40, 45,000 pounds. Okay? Um, of interest to some of you might be the fact that uh, the, the U.S. is currently investigating uh, advanced technology, so electromagnetic technology, um, that will allow us to move beyond the steam catapult. So now we just use electricity. There's an abundance of that with a nuclear uh, reactor on board a Nimitz-class aircraft carrier um, to drive the mechanism that launches the aircraft off the bow of the ship. The third innovation pictured here in the lower right um, is the Fresnel lens. Um, this is an optical landing system that allows the pilot to uh, judge the aircraft's position relative to the optimal glide slope for landing. Um, it's affectionately known as the meatball or just the ball. We'll come back to that here as we move forward. So today, 13 countries operate some form of aircraft carrier, from the latest uh, Nimitz-class supercarrier, the USS H. Uh, George H.W. Bush um, to this small and frankly irrelevant Thai carrier, the uh, Shakri Narubit. Mm -hmm. um, it reportedly can carry 29 aircraft. I think if you look on the internet, it's only ever been seen carrying one helicopter, and there's some debate as to whether that helicopter even works. But that notwithstanding, <laughs> it is an aircraft carrier. So for the purposes of this discussion, uh, we're going to break aircraft carriers down into essentially three categories. So the first, uh, two examples pictured in the top left of the slide, um, are Japanese ships Hyuga and Ismo. Now for political reasons, they're called helicopter destroyers, okay? Um, but anybody that is familiar with, it, uh, with uh, aircraft carriers will be quick to identify that as something that looks remarkably like what the U.S. would call an amphibious or a helicopter assault ship, okay? So these ships, purpose-built to support helicopter operations, uh, launch pads um, for um, relatively close in operations to the shore um, in support of uh, helicopters and ground troops uh, as they move ashore. Pictured in the top right is a Chinese J-15 flanker that's based on the Russian Sukhoi Su-27 uh, model, okay? Uh, and it is launching from the ski jump of the CV-16, the Chinese carrier Liaoning. Now, it's interesting, the ski jump type of uh, aircraft carriers were originally conceived to support uh, short takeoff and vertical landing aircraft like the AV-8 uh, Harrier, uh, the, uh, the Sea Harrier, and soon to be the, uh, the Bravo variant of the F-35 Lightning II. Um, so it's interesting, uh, if you're familiar with the flanker, it's a large airplane, it's a fixed-wing airplane. The Chinese, um, at this stage in their development, in their journey into carrier aviation, um, that they have elected to pair a conventional fighter aircraft with a ski jump uh, configured uh, aircraft carrier. The bottom, uh, the bottom uh, photograph is of the uh, USS Harry S. Truman, uh, one of my alma maters. Um, she is a, uh, an angle deck, nuclear-powered angle deck uh, aircraft carrier um, that uh, supports operation, flight operations with steam catapults and uh, arresting gear. Um, so that's where most of my uh, experience is, so that's where we'll take the rest of this discussion. So very briefly on the Nimitz-class aircraft carrier. The uh, U.S. currently operates 10 Nimitz-class aircraft carriers, um, the inheritors of a legacy of 57 aircraft carriers that uh, have gone before them. <clears throat> they, uh, they measure approximately 1,000 feet long. Uh, they weigh in at about 100,000 tons. Um, although they appear pretty, uh, they are large and they appear pretty vulnerable, um, they are actually pretty capable of defending themselves. Um, they're very, very maneuverable. They're very fast. Um, and uh, they boast a suite of uh, pretty impressive sensors um, and weapon systems, close-in weapon systems, uh, to uh, defend themselves if required. They will also typically deploy with at least one uh, Aegis-class destroyer or cruiser, a guided missile uh, ship that uh, will augment the air defense capability of the entire group. Okay. So, uh, starting with the primary weapon system of the aircraft carrier, the flight deck, um, we'll start with the uh, catapults. As mentioned, steam catapults, they number four on a Nimitz-class carrier. Starting here on the uh, forward starboard side is the number one catapult, and they're numbered one through four, two, three, and four. 
These two are known as waste cats. These two are called bow cats, as you'd expect. Okay? The arresting gear, this is called the landing area. The arresting gear are numbered one through four, starting in the aft and moving forward. The, um, the, the flight deck is, uh, is angled, as we discussed, um, and although that does allow for simultaneous launch and recovery of aircraft, the most efficient way we've found to employ aircraft carriers um, in operations is called cyclic operations. So basically what that amounts to is we break up um, the number of aircraft that we need to launch into groups, into overheads or uh, into cycles. And what ends up happening is that as one group is waiting to come aboard, they are orbiting overhead the aircraft carrier, another cycle is launching. Ideally, as the last aircraft of that launch cycle launches, probably from the number one, maybe the number two cat, the first airplane of the recovery rolls in behind the aircraft carrier and commences its approach. He rolls into the groove, we say. Okay. Um, supporting the flight operations uh, are um, a suite uh, is a suite of advanced sensors um, that are run out of the tower uh, here uh, during daylight uh, good weather conditions. Um, at night and during bad weather, we run air operations out of what's called the Carrier Air Traffic Control Center, which is in the heart of the uh, aircraft carrier. Okay, and we'll get we'll come on to that here again in a second. Uh, also very important to flight operations is the hangar deck, the unsung heroes um, of uh, air operations or the maintainers, and all of the heavy maintenance on those aircraft that has to go on, uh, both preventative um, and uh, to repair airplanes, occurs on that hangar deck. The hangar deck um, is serviced by four uh, main, there are lots of elevators actually on the flight deck, but the four main ones starting here are one, two, three, and four. They're very high speed and they can accommodate approximately two fighter size aircraft and a whole bunch of other stuff, okay? So uh, a lot of capacity there. All right, um, flight deck personnel. Uh, I want to talk very briefly about flight deck jersey cover colors, which might seem a little trivial if you're already familiar with this. I apologize. Um, but uh, everybody on the flight deck wears um, some uh, pr protective equipment, as you'd expect. So they wear a, a cranial with uh, hearing protection integrated and goggles. Um, and they also wear a float coat, um, so a life preserver, essentially, if they uh, are blown overboard by jet exhaust. Um, and they wear um, a, a flight deck jersey. Um, the float coat, the jersey, and the cranial uh, are all color-coded according to that person's role on the flight deck. So starting with the yellow shirts, the yellow shirts um, are basically two groups of people. Um, the catapult and arresting gear officers, who are affectionately known as shooters because they're the people who shoot the airplanes off the pointy end of the ship. Um, and also the, uh, the aircraft directors. So these are the people that we entrust with guiding pilots as they taxi the aircraft around the confined space that is the flight deck, okay? Um, so they are often uh, guiding airplanes to within inches of the deck edge or other aircraft equipment, people, et cetera. So um, there's an important trust relationship that develops between the pilot, the air crew, um, and, uh, and those yellow shirts. Moving on to the blue shirts. The blue shirts are uh, aircraft uh, handlers. Um, so these are the people who are responsible for chaining down the airplanes when they're not running so that they don't blow off or slide off the flight deck. Um, they also do things like drive the tractors for the support equipment around, um, either to service the airplanes or to get them started, things of that nature. Uh, next, the green shirts uh, are going to be associated either with the catapult and arresting gear systems, doing maintenance on them, or doing uh, aircraft maintenance. So um, uh, I, I skipped over this uh, before. I meant to allude to it. Um, the, uh, the, the Nimitz class uh, crew complement is a total of about 5,000 people. Uh, of those, about 3,500 are ship's company. They work for the captain of the ship. Um, and the other 1,500 belong to the air wing, okay? So those green shirts could work either for the ship or they could work for the squadrons fixing airplanes. Um, next, the red shirts. Uh, anybody wearing red has something to do with things that either blow up or catch fire, okay? So they're either crash and salvage type people, firemen, um, or they're ordnance uh, type folks. Purple shirts, my father uh, has a special place in his heart for these folks who are uh, involved with aviation fuels. They're affectionately known as grapes for what should be obvious reasons, uh, and they work for the uh, aircraft carrier. Um, next, a uh, little bit difficult to see down here in the bottom left are some folks wearing brown shirts. Um, they are almost all squadron personnel. Um, they are almost all plane captains, or what you might call a, uh, um, 
uh, I'll come back to it, and I can't remember what the Air Force term is. Um, but we call ours plane captains. They didn't, they, what's that? Crew chief. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, you might call them a crew chief. So they tend to be very young people uh, in their early 20s or late teens. Um, they're responsible for um, basic servicing of the aircraft, make sure it's got oil, make sure it's got gas, hydraulic fluid in it, and things of that nature. Uh, they're also responsible for starting up the airplane with the pilot. Okay, So they step the pilot through the startup sequence. Finally, I think, I'll make sure I haven't skipped over anybody. Finally, we'll come on to the white shirts. Um, white shirts are uh, folks who are involved with safety. So they're either quality assurance type people, they might be troubleshooters, medical, safety observers, people of that nature. All right, so um, everybody who works on the flight deck or the hangar deck of the aircraft carrier works for one of two people. Um, as I said, about 3,500 people on the ship work for the captain of the ship, okay? And the captain of the ship, ultimately, if push comes to shove, he's... He's God at sea, okay? Um, the other 1,500 people, the people who work with the squadrons, work for the air wing commander, okay? Uh, the air wing commander, the air wing is a separate command, okay? They don't work for the captain of the ship, so there's, there's a relationship there that has to be, uh, that has to be fostered uh, and is really, really important. The people who work on the flight deck or in the hangar deck but don't work for the air wing commander, known as CAG, you might have heard that term, um, they work for a person called the air boss who works for the captain of the ship, okay? So, one of two other key players on the flight deck, the air boss, um, is responsible for everything that occurs on the flight deck, the hangar deck, and within, in the air in the immediate vicinity of the aircraft carrier, okay? Um, he is somebody that you pay attention to. If he tells you to do something or not to do something, you listen. It is not like the movie Top Gun. If you were to, if you were, if you were to fly a high speed past after hearing the words "negative Ghost Rider," the pattern is full. You would, at a bare minimum, lose your wings. You would probably face court martial. Okay, it's a really big deal. He is in charge. Other really important players on the flight deck are the landing signal officers, or LSOs for short, pictured here in white float coats and uh, flight suits. Okay, these are air wing pilots who are specially trained to observe uh, aircraft as they land and to ensure that they do so safely, okay? Um, so there's an important uh, relationship that builds between the pilots of the, uh, of, of the uh, air wing and the air wing LSOs, okay? And we'll come on to a little bit about how that works uh, in a minute. So LSOs uh, started, their, uh, started their lives in 1922 aboard USS Langley, CV-1, our first uh, active aircraft carrier, purpose-built aircraft carrier. Uh, as you can see here, um, in order to transmit visual signals to the pilots as they came aboard, they used modified semaphore flags okay, um, that looked remarkably like ping pong paddles. So today, we call our LSOs, um, you know, their nickname, their call sign is Paddles. So now what I want to do is step you through a few phases of a typical flight, okay? This will just be sort of the wave tops. Uh, we can come back to anything, any questions you might have during the Q&A. So the launch sequence starts, essentially. The aircraft is already powered up. We're ready to go. We remove all of the chains, okay, and we remove the chocks. The airplane gets handed off to one of those yellow, yellow shirts, one of the taxi directors. The taxi director, uh, the yellow shirt, uh, guides the airplane to one of the four catapults, okay? Um, and the air crew and the deck crew communicate typically using hand signals. Okay, there's an awful lot going on on the flight deck. It's really loud, as you might expect. Um, so uh, hand signals, light signals at night are really the way to go. So as the aircraft approaches the catapult, they're going to do a couple of things that are uh, important. They're going to be running some final checks on the airplane, um, and very important, they're going to communicate what the gross weight of that airplane is, because it's really important to know that so that the catapult gives the airplane, technical term, enough oomph to get off the bow of the ship, okay? So when all of that is done, the, uh, the deck crew, the uh, catapult crew will physically um, uh, hook up the airplane to the catapult mechanism called the shuttle. Um, the shooter will then be passed control of the airplane from the yellow shirt, okay? There's always a positive passing of control from one yellow shirt to the other. The shooter signals the uh, pilot that we're ready to go, come up to full power. As the pilot advances the throttles to uh, max uh, military rated thrust, not afterburner yet, um, we'll um, uh, run through a uh, wipeout. Meanwhile, two young troubleshooters two 20-something pink bodies are going to run underneath this airplane that is at full power, and they are going to check for leaking fluid, missing fasteners, open panels, something that's just not quite right. If everything looks good to them, they exit 
They, give a, they pass a thumbs up to the shooter who uh, indicates to the pilot that we are ready to go. When the pilot is happy, the pilot renders a crisp salute to the uh, shooter who touches the deck and points towards the bow of the ship, as you can see here. At which point, yet another person who's off, off to the side looks left and right, one more final check to make sure there's nothing standing in the way, they push a button and we're off to the races. Um, in about two seconds, a 65,000 pound airplane is accelerated from zero to about 180 knots. Pretty, it's, it's a great ride. Um, after the airplane has cleared the deck, um, the, air, uh, the, uh, the pilot uh, cleans up the airplane, so raises the, uh, the gear and flaps, does what's called a clearing turn just to ensure that uh, we've got traffic separation, and then enters a pre-briefed, we've just got a playbook and we always fly the same departure pattern every day, same way, okay? So they go out, they do their training mission, they do their operational mission, whatever that happens to be, and when it comes time to come back to the boat, as we call it, um, there are essentially three ways to do it. Um, case one, two, and three. Case one, we use during the daytime when the weather is good. Uh, it involves all of the airplane coming overhead the ship, uh, airplanes coming overhead the ship at a pre-briefed altitude. Um, they join up and they essentially watch the deck because remember we're in cyclic operations so other airplanes are taking off as these airplanes are coming back from their mission. Okay, When the timing looks right, and it appears that we're about ready to launch the last couple airplanes, the aircraft that are lowest in the stack overhead the ship commence their approach. And they enter this racetrack pattern, um, there's a little bit of glare there, but uh, hopefully you can see it, um, that essentially looks like something you would fly at a civilian airport. Only instead of flying at 1,000 or 1,500 feet, we enter at 800 feet here, we break to downwind, and we fly a 600 foot pattern, okay? Um, Right. The, um, the, other, the other possibility uh, for night or bad weather is called case three. Case three is depicted on the right side of the slide. Um, now, uh, the CATSI, that Carrier Air Traffic Control Center, is going to assign a point and an altitude to the airplanes as they come back to uh, the aircraft carrier. And it's not overhead the ship usually, it's someplace else. Okay? Um, they also assign a, an, an expected approach time. If the air crew don't hear anything else, when that approach time arrives, they commence their approach, okay? So lots of, lots of operations that happen without any communications at all, all right? The aircraft uh, essentially line up on a straight-in approach using timing for separation, um, and uh, they use uh, precision approach equipment uh, on the aircraft carrier as well as uh, approach controllers to help uh, them uh, as they uh, fly their approach. They fly into three quarters of a mile, at which point CATSI, the Air Traffic Control Center, hands off the airplane to the tower and to paddles, the LSOs, by saying three quarters of a mile, call the ball. At which point the pilot says something to the effect of 501, prowler ball, 6.9. 501 is the side number of the airplane, so there's somebody, there are actually lots of people checking to make sure we've got all the side numbers back, because that's really important. Prowler is really important because <clears throat> the, um, the arresting gear settings uh, are very much dependent on the type of airplane that's coming aboard. So there are a lot of people making sure that, yep, okay, we've got a prowler coming down the chute, we've got the arresting gear set appropriately. And then the 5.9, 6.9, that's the number of thousands of pounds of gas remaining in the airplane on approach, which, as you might expect, is also being tracked uh, very, uh, very closely, okay? Um, the LSOs um, are simply going to say, if everything looks good, Roger Ball, and that clears the airplane to land. Okay. Uh, case two does exist. I'm not going to go into it now. It's essentially a hybrid of these two things. We use it for daytime in between weather. Not great weather. We don't use it very often, to be frank, but it does exist. Okay, landing. The last 15 to 18 seconds inside of that three quarters of a mile um, is usually characterized by a flurry of activity in the cockpit. Okay, so the pilot is making hundreds of minute corrections, uh, mostly with the throttle, uh, to make sure that the airplane uh, is, remains within safe parameters for landing. And the whole time the LSOs are assisting the pilot in doing so. Okay. So the pilot has three things, essentially, that he needs to reference in order to ma maintain a safe pass. The first is lineup. 
uh, lineup is nothing more than making sure that we are referenced to the center line of that landing area and it's going to run right down between our legs when we land. Okay? That's very important for obvious reasons to ensure safe separation from other stuff that might be on the flight deck. It's also important because if you're not on center line, the information that this thing over here is uh, giving you is not accurate. Okay? So this thing over here, as we mentioned earlier, the Fresnel lens, uh, also known as the ball, um, is providing the pilot glide slope information. So you can see there's this orb, this kind of yellow orb in the middle, and these green lights uh, arrayed horizontally. The green lights are called datums. So if the ball is higher than the datums, then the aircraft is high. Conversely, if the meatball is low, reference to the datums, then the aircraft is low. Um, so ideally, what the pilot is doing is trying to um, influence with power um, where that meatball sits and to keep it either centered or even ideally about a half a ball high. That's usually what the LSOs want to see. That ensures that you don't taxi into the one wire, uh, which is not a good thing. So, as you might expect, naval aviators, carrier aviators, we do lots of landing practice uh, ashore. I've probably got somewhere around four or 5,000 landings ashore, all for about 200 uh, and change uh, carrier landings, okay? Um, and we live by the mantra, meatball, line up, angle of attack. Meatball, line up, angle of attack. I skipped angle of attack. Uh, angle of attack is the third thing that needs to be referenced. Um, that is provided uh, by the aircraft's onboard systems, okay? So it's referenced inside the cockpit. Um, angle of attack, as I'm sure most of you know, that just references where the air, how the airplane is flying uh, with, um, uh, with, um, in relation to the relative wind, okay? So a high angle of attack approach looks something like this. A low angle of attack approach looks like that. Um, high angle of attack, or maintaining the optimum angle of attack, is important because it puts the hook in a good place to engage the wires as the aircraft lands and to stop the airplane, okay? Uh, too high of an angle of attack and uh, you're very close to stall, so the airplane could just stall and fall out of the sky, and we've got um, cases of that having happened uh, in history. Too low of an angle of attack, and what you end up doing is pulling that hook point up, and so you're not giving yourself a chance for that hook to engage the wires. <coughs> Paddles. Um, so. As I mentioned, uh, the LSOs, there are several of them that are on that platform, and they are all observing every single pass um, that uh, occurs during that recovery, okay? They're making sure that the airplane um, remains within safe parameters, and they grade every single pass. So there's a competitive element to this sport, okay? <laughs> um, if everything is going right, uh, the only thing the pilot's gonna hear, if anything, is Roger Ball. He might just give him a light signal. Not, might not even talk to him, okay? Um, but if things are not going so well, then the LSO has uh, several standardized voice communications that he can make in order to help the pilot. Um, the pilot might not um, be able to observe some things. There could be some things that the ship is doing that the pilot isn't, isn't wise to. So the LSO can use those voice commands. There are also some light signals that they can use uh, to help the pilot adjust their approach, okay? If everything goes to hell in a handbasket, um, the, the uh, LSOs will, we say, we, they'll pickle the airplane, they'll pickle the, uh, the aircraft, um, and they'll, te so by telling the pilot, wave off, wave off, and if there's a reason for it, they'll, they'll oftentimes tell them what the reason is. They'll also flash a big set of really red lights, really bright red lights, um, and uh, at which point the pilot goes around and tries again, okay? So if, uh, if you fly the best pass of your life, the best grade that you can get is an okay pass. That's as good as it gets, okay? Um, from there, we devolve to fair and then no grade passes. Uh, we also award passes, uh, grades for uh, wave offs. So if the airplane has to go around and never touches the deck, if it's the pilot's fault, then you get a bad grade for that. Um, if the airplane lands but fails to stop and it's the pilot's fault, you get a grade for that. Um, and then, God forbid, if you do something uh, outright dangerous, they'll award you what's called a cut pass, um, which is no credit and a quick trip to CAG, and then you're going to stop very briefly with CAG, and then you're going to go to the captain of the ship, um, mm -hmm. and you're probably in danger of not flying for a while, if ever again, depending on the circumstances. 
After landing, uh, as soon as the main mounts touch the flight deck, we assume that the airplane is not going to stop, okay, because we need to maintain that forward momentum. So we all are instinctively tr trained to instinctively ram the throttles as far forward as they will go to ensure flyaway speed um, if the airplane doesn't stop. So every airplane that you see land, if it's got afterburner, you'll see it come into afterburner very briefly. Uh, once all motion ceases, come back on the power very quickly, clean up the wings, and start folding them because there's a taxi director, one of those yellow shirts, who's waiting at about your one o'clock position saying, you're in the landing area, get out of the landing area. So you taxi clear the landing area. <laughs> meanwhile, that uh, you raise the hook. Um, meanwhile, that wire is being retracted. And depending day or night, good weather, bad weather, somewhere around 45 seconds later, another airplane is going to land right behind you. OK? OK, so I have a couple of videos for you. Um, this, uh, this first one um, is uh, um, part of a squadron video that uh, our, one of our LSOs in, my, uh, in one of my squadrons put together. Okay, So this will give you uh, a brief um, recap of what I have attempted to, to uh, convey to you about landing on the boat. An enormous machine with the sole purpose of launching and recovering aircraft. Landing on one is a game of inches. Its runway is about 400 feet long and 75 feet wide. To land, a pilot tries to snag one of the four wires pulled taut across the deck with a hook hanging off the tail of the aircraft. The pilot's goal is to grab the third wire, which is accomplished by flying with the assistance of an optical lens that brings you down on a preset glide slope. The guide in this endeavor is a bright orange light referred to as the meatball. From the aircraft, if the meatball looks high relative to a string of green horizontal lights called the datum, then you know you are too high. Just the same, if it is below the datum, then you are too low. Unlike other aircraft, in the EA-6B there is a pilot and ECMO sitting side by side trying to land the plane together. Traveling at 175 miles per hour in a 25-ton aircraft, they aim to land on an area of steel no bigger than your driveway. The difficulty of this is easily compounded by night, rough seas, or bad weather. In rough seas, the flight deck can move more than 30 feet, so that no matter how well the jet is flown, a landing isn't even possible. Flying in bad weather can give the pilot only about 10 seconds to see the carrier, make corrections to the flight path, and acquire the meatball halfway up the flight deck. This is why we make the Air Force look like preschoolers. Okay, um, my dad actually uh, also asked me to uh, address just a few things about strike integration and strike operations. So uh, just a few thoughts uh, before we go into uh, questions and answer. Um, the first uh, consideration I put up here is uh, single versus multi-carrier operations. Um, single uh, carrier operations are sort of what we tend to train to um, as we're getting ready for our deployment cycle. Um, a single carrier can generate hundreds of sorties a day, um, but um, they can surge to 24 op hour operations, but they can't do that forever is where I'll leave it, okay? Um, <clears throat> so single carrier operation does buy you several hundred sorties um, in a week, say, um, but uh, although it's powered by a nuclear uh, reactor, in the case of a Nimitz class, um, the people are not powered by a nuclear uh, <laughs> reactor. They need food, the airplanes need gas, um, you need replacement parts, things like that. Um, so there's going to, intuitively, there's going to be a point where that ship needs to uh, come down uh, off of operations for a little while. Um, but in a single carrier environment, you've got these 5,000 people, uh, and specifically about 3,000 people who are directly involved in air operations, who have been training together for months, actually close to a year, uh, before they come on that deployment. So they under understand the way uh, one another work. Um, the playbook, as I kind of alluded to, for how we depart, how we recover, all of that is standardized. So everybody understands what the other is going to do according to the playbook. The communications plan is very straightforward. Everybody's on the same radio frequency when they need to be on the same radio frequency, okay? Um, it also, if you've just got one carrier out there, um, depending on the situation, you are maximizing that carrier's ability to maneuver if it needs to, um, either to defend itself or just because they're chasing wind, as you might expect. Uh, where the wind is blowing is important for carrier operations, okay? 
if we have two or more aircraft carriers, um, I would say you can sustain 24-hour operations almost forever, okay? Um, so that's, that's a pretty bold statement, um, uh, and it surprises a lot of people, and there are some caveats to that. However, as a broad statement, if I've got two aircraft carriers, I can definitely give you 24-hour operations for a really long time, okay? <clears throat> um, however, you've got now two groups of 5,000 people, um, or more, right, who have only trained together, uh, probably haven't trained together, frankly. Um, but, uh, and so all of those things become about how you depart, how you recover, uh, what radio frequency you happen to be on, those get uh, immensely more complicated, okay? So we do train in the multi-carrier environment. Um, we get a little bit of it. We see it uh, for about a week or two. Um, just to make sure that uh, we know not to land on the wrong aircraft carrier. Um, if we're faced with that in the real world, that's a little, little bit tongue in cheek. Um, but uh, but uh, again, so you've you've uh, you've got that added complexity, um, and then given the environment, you have now restricted those carriers' ability to maneuver. Okay, because they have to reference one another constantly as they do their job. Okay. The next point up there. Uh, operating in an integrated manner with other folks, whether those are what we call joint, so Air Force specifically, but also Army, um, troops ashore, um, and in coalitions. Um, so the first thing I would uh, say is that in the planning process, we will always advocate for having somebody who is carrier aviation savvy in the planning room if carriers are gonna really feature in whatever is going on, whether that be a training or uh, an operational setting, okay? Um, because there's a lot of myth and folklore about what aircraft carriers can and cannot do. And it's important that people who are uninformed don't make the wrong decisions in the planning process. Uh, joint training, uh, hard to come by. If we can get it, we absolutely love it, love to do it because it really broadens everybody's horizons uh, and makes everybody generally better. Um, but then once we get on operations, um, there is no uh, substitute for liaison officers. So what you will find is that on board the carrier, we will typically have um, at least one representative from the ground forces. We call a ground liaison officer or a GLOW. We'll have at least one representative from the Air Operations Center, if there is one, um, typically an Air Force person, who's on board the carrier just to help make the coordination between the various parties occur. Um, and then we're operating in a coalition environment. When I deployed on Truman in 2007, 2008, um, we had British officers on board because we deployed with the British frigate in our strike group. Um, and that's, uh, that's worth its weight in gold. Conversely, it's also important that if we arrive in a theater where there is an air operation center where most of the air war is being coordinated, um, it's important that the carrier send a representative ashore so that we can again make sure that that coordination occurs. The last thing I will bring up is logistics. I think it was a Marine Corps general named uh, General Barrow, uh, Richard Barrow back in 1980-81, uh, who was quoted as saying that uh, uh, amateurs talk about tactics, professionals talk about logistics. That statement could not be more true uh, than for an aircraft carrier at sea. Um, keeping an aircraft carrier uh, in the fight, particularly if we're operating in what we call a blue water environment, which means we're really far out to sea, um, out, uh, you know, out away from the watchful eyes of whoever might be looking for us, um, gets to be uh, very, very complex um, and quite a challenge, uh, okay? But as I, as I said, the nuclear, power, the nuclear power plant on board the aircraft carrier will keep the, the machine running for almost forever. However, at some point, we need to resupply the people and the airplanes. 